Good morning. morning. Welcome to St. Paul. Thank you for joining us on a beautiful Sunday morning. Glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, This morning we are continuing our Tender Commandment series. We've been kind of in this series uh, since the week after Easter, uh, and today we arrive at the Seventh Commandment. Our theme for this morning is Beg, Borrow, But Don't Steal. You know, and as we think about the commandments, you know, sometimes we can think of them as, as rules, as regulations, as laws from God, and they are those things, right? Uh, but really, they are given to us from a God who loves us. He knows and wants what's best for us, and so he gives us instructions on the things that are gonna make our life happy and full versus the things that are gonna bring us trouble and despair and all those things. So we keep that in mind as we think about our uh, seventh commandment today, beg, borrow, but don't steal. Well, once again, glad to have you in service this morning. Let's stand as we begin with our invocation and our opening hymn. We begin this morning as we invite God to join us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our opening hymn, O Blessed Holy Trinity. Good morning, and please be seated. We get to start off our service today hearing from God and the wonderful words that he has to say to us in the Bible. Our first reading can be found on page 1201 in your pew Bibles, and it comes from James chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. What causes quarrels? And what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says? He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. 
but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for our gospel reading. And our gospel can be found on page 1043 in your pew Bibles. And it comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Uh, this will be the basis for Pastor Kyle's sermon this morning. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. And now we get to go before God and confess to him our sins. The seventh commandment that God has given to us is, you shall not steal. We all, though, have taken things that don't belong to us. We have taken things because we thought that we earned it or that we deserved it. We justify taking things that do not belong to us because we have a desire for more or for better. Yet, God calls us to recognize that he provides for all of our needs and that all we have is a gift from him. Let us go before God and confess all the times we have failed to be content with the things he has given us, for all the times we have taken what doesn't belong to us, and for all the other sins of our lives. We confess together. Lord God, you graciously provide for all my needs. You have given me house and home, clothing, food, and all that I need for my daily life. You have given me what I need most in your son, Jesus. Yet often I fail to recognize that all that I have is a gift from you. Forgive me for all the times that I have been selfish and greedy, taken things that don't belong to me, and for all the other sins of my life. By your spirit, help me to remember that everything is a gift from you and to be content with what you provide. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God is generous. Out of love for you, he gave you what you need most for this life, and he has given you what we need most in Jesus, forgiveness. God calls us to contentment and to share the blessings that we have with others so that they may see his love in us. I'm sorry, to share. God calls us to contentment and to share the blessings that we have with others so that they may see his love in us. Because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for you, all of your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Having received what you need most, go and share his blessings and the good news of God's love with others. Amen. And now we profess the faith that we have 
In the words of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We received God's forgiveness as we confessed our sins. We just professed the faith that we have in that forgiveness of sins. And now, once again, we sinners get to receive God's forgiveness in, a, in another way, in a very special way as we partake of the body and blood that he shed on the cross to earn for us that forgiveness. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Welcome to the Lord's table. Please be seated.
Please stand. You have received the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, and all of your sins are forgiven. Through this gift, may he strengthen your faith, give you peace, and encourage you to share his love with others. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this incredible gift. We, we thank you that, that you gave your life so that we could not only be forgiven, Lord, but that we can, we can receive you into ourselves, your true body and blood, for the forgiveness of our sins and so that we can go with you each and every moment of each and every day. And God, I pray that you would please go with us. I pray that you'd live in us and work through us, Lord, to do your good and gracious and glorious will wherever that would be and whatever you want us to do. Lead us and guide us in that, God, and please help us to live for you until the day you call us home. We ask this all in your great name. Amen. We continue in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all that you provide for us. Help us to be content and to be good stewards of all that you provide so that we may be generous to others. Open the hearts of those who do not know you and strengthen the faith of others through our witness. In Jesus' name, amen. Almighty God, you have called your church to share and proclaim the gospel to the world. Be with all the pastors and delegates that will gather together this next week for the 56th convention of the South Wisconsin District. Guide and direct the decisions that are made as they choose those who will lead our church body for the next three years. Where there is division in the body of Christ, grant reconciliation and forgiveness. Where there is reason for joy, let us all join together in celebration. Continue to work through the South Wisconsin District, its churches and ministries, so that many more might hear the good news of Jesus and be connected to Christ. Heavenly Father, you have suffered fully the cost of love through your Son. We pray that you would give healing to those who are afflicted in mind, body, or soul. We especially pray for Philip Bertram, who was taken to the hospital earlier this week, for a nephew, I'm sorry, for a husband and wife who have medical issues, and for many others that are experiencing these difficulties. We pray that you would be with these people, that you would watch over them, and if it is your will, we ask that you would guide the hands of the doctors and the medical staff to bring healing. We also lift up to you the family of Sandra Garland, who passed away earlier this week, and for uh, the nephew, the family of, the, of a nephew of one of our members who has recently died from brain cancer. We pray that you would bring peace to these families as they grieve and remind them of your love and strength in the midst of their loss and give them comfort with your presence. Give them the strength for the days ahead and keep them trusting in your promise of the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting with you. Almighty God, through the washing of water and the word, we are united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. And we ask that you would be with Isabella Reed who will become a member of your family through baptism later today. Help her to grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Be with Isabella's parents as they raise and teach her to be your child. Keep us all trusting in Jesus all the days of our lives. Gracious Lord, in the beginning you created Adam and Eve and you brought them together in the garden to work together and to care for one another. We ask that you be with Tom and Janet Jenny as they celebrate their anniversary this next week and also with Robert and Evelyn Schrader as they celebrate their anniversary next week. Continue to keep them growing in their love for you and for each other. May their relationships and all husbands and wives reflect the love that you have shown us through your son. For all these things and for whatever else you know us, and we pray it all trusting in Jesus' name, and we join together in the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. 
But at this time, I ask that you would please find that red vinyl-covered folder at the end of your pew, and please record your attendance with us here this morning. For all of you, welcome. Thank you for joining us. For all of those online, thank you so much also for tuning in and watching. We pray that this service would be edifying for you and that you would hear God's word because God is the one that each and every one of us needs. If you are visiting this morning, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Pastor Rob and this is Pastor Kyle. We would love to meet you after the service. Please come and introduce yourselves. It would be our great pleasure to get to know you better. With that, our ushers are coming forward so that we can dedicate our tithes and our offerings to the God who has given us everything that we have, even the gift of eternal life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord God, we lift up to you these offerings. We thank you for them, and we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you what you have given to us, Lord. You have given us everything that we have. Please help us to live our lives generously, just as you've been generous to us. Please help us to continually give of our time, our money, our talents and gifts to further your kingdom here on earth. Work through us, God, to do that. Humble us, help us to be honest with ourselves, and help us to be generous to support your kingdom on earth. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I said before, if you've been with us since Easter, you know that we've been in a series called The Tender Commandments. And today we're looking at the seventh commandment. And what we need to recognize about these commandments is that they are not overbearing tasks or rules or regulations that God has given to us. He's not looking for an opportunity to strike us down, but rather that all of these commandments, they are all tender, loving instructions of our Heavenly Father to us. We are His children. The seventh commandment comes to us from Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Let's read it together. It's up there on the screens. You shall not steal. You shall not steal. We all know it, right? We can all say, I have that covered. I don't take things that don't belong to me. Let's say amen and go home, right? <laughs> Let me say that that commandment doesn't come with an asterisk. It doesn't mean that we don't steal unless it's someone close to us who isn't going to mind. It doesn't mean that we don't steal unless it's a little thing that no one is going to notice. It doesn't mean that we don't steal unless it's something that no one is going to care about. No, we are called not to steal. How many of you, as I said before, would say, I've never stolen anything in my life? Good, because next week is the Eighth Commandment. We're going to talk about lying. We're good. <laughs> No, all of us, we are all guilty of this. We've all stolen something. We've all taken things that don't belong to us. Maybe it, was, maybe it was something small, maybe it was something big, but we all have taken things that don't belong to us. You shall not steal is the commandment, and it seems simple enough. But in the catechism, after each commandment, there's an explanation. And the question is asked, the explanation, or the question is asked, what does this mean? And the explanation to every commandment, they all start the same way. We should fear and love God so that we, and that first statement is a call back to the first commandment. We should have no other gods before us. But the commandment goes on, or the explanation goes on. It says we should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way. And again, most of us would say, well, that's easy. I can do that. But the explanation goes one more line. It says, but help him to improve and protect his possessions. You see, not just are we called not to take our neighbor's things, but we are called to help them protect their things, to protect their income. And our neighbor is everyone around us. 
Whether we like them or not, whether their tree hangs over our fence, whether their dog comes and does his business on our yard every morning, it doesn't matter. Whether we get along or we don't, our neighbor is everyone around us. We are called to help protect the things that God gives to us and to everyone around us. Now, let me ask another question. How many of you had had, have had something stolen from you? Yeah, that one's a little easier to raise our hands to, isn't it? I can safely recall only a few times in my life where I've had something stolen from me. One was when we were moving to Fort Wayne for seminary. We were in the process of moving in, and my car was unlocked, and someone went and took a box right off the front seat of my car and walked away. Great start to seminary. The other one was a couple years ago. For my birthday, I got a really nice grill from my wife, and so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go buy a nice cover. I'm gonna protect it, I'm gonna keep it nice. And I had that cover on it for about two months, and someone went and took not the whole grill, but the cover. Why, I'm not sure. They did. You know, when someone steals from you, it hurts, doesn't it? It steals your peace. We live in a broken world where people lie and they take and they steal and they cheat and they deceive. But as Christians, you and I, we are called to be different. We are called to do the right thing all the time. Now, there was a study done by Professor Dan Airley. He's a professor at Duke University. He's written a number of times for the Wall Street Journal. And a couple of years ago, he wrote a book called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. And he did an experiment to see how truthful people really are. He gave people a 25 question math test and five minutes to complete it. Now if it were me, the correct answers would be zero. I'm terrible at math. But this test was entirely self-graded. Some got 10 right, some got 15 right. They got the answer key, they were told to then take the, uh, to memorize how many they got right, to take the test, to put it in a shredder in the back of the classroom, and then to report the number they had gotten right to the instructor. However, what he found was that most people got six questions right. And the reason he knew this is that the shredder in the back of the classroom wasn't really a shredder. It just kind of chopped the edges of the paper. And so what he found was that the average person had increased their score by two points. It was a small difference, but having done this with over 30,000 people, very few were 100% truthful. Very few lied by a lot, but the majority lied by a little bit. They bumped up their score just a few points. Most people when it comes to something like that, when it comes to a a small lie or taking something small that doesn't belong to them, Professor Airely found that most people no longer see that as wrong. Professor Airely went on to say in his book, he says, quote, we want to view ourselves as honest, wonderful people, and when we cheat, as long as we cheat just a little bit, we can still view ourselves as good people. Reading that quote reminded me of a clip. Let's turn our attention to the screen this morning. I got these great salt and pepper shakers from the restaurant. Oh, that's not cool. Dude, none of this is cool. <laughs> Look, Chandler, you, you have to find the line between stealing and, and taking what the hotel owes you. Um, for example, a hair dryer, no, no, no. But shampoos and conditioners, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Now, the the salt shaker is off limits, but the salt... (laughs) I wish I'd thought this through. I think I get what you mean, though. Like, the the lamp is uh, is the hotel's, but the bulbs... Oh, you you already got that. Not my first time in a hotel, my friend. (laughs) Okay, uh, how about this? No, 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 you can't take the remote control. Yes, but the batteries... You know, how many of you have seen that clip from Friends before? All right, a couple of hands. 
You know, as sinful people, we're kind of like that, aren't we? We try to find that fine line about taking, uh, that they were talking about. We try to figure out and justify in our minds not stealing but taking what is owed to us. What do I deserve? Maybe you've signed into a wireless internet signal that wasn't yours or you take your cart up to the grocery store to the cashier and she forgets to scan an item. You did the right thing. You tried to pay for it. She forgot and so we try to justify it in our minds. We're not really stealing. You know, people in the world, we often want to look around and we want to make comparisons. We want to say, well, I'm not as bad as that person or this person over here. I've never done this bad thing or, or that bad thing. And as sinful Christians, we, like the rest of the world, like the people in Professor Airely's study, we want to view ourselves as good people. We want to see ourselves as wonderful and honest when it comes to the truth, when it comes to taking things that don't belong to us. And yet we are often quick to forget the truth of God's word. James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. We have all stolen. We have all done wrong. We have all sinned. We are all guilty. Now what I want to do now is, is shift our thinking about stealing from the legal definition uh, what does the law really say? If it's, a, if it's something small, it's no big deal. If it's a big thing, well, then it's a big deal. And what I want to do now is then think about and look at it from God's perspective. Because when we look at the seventh commandment from God's perspective, the truth is, is that it's all a big deal. I want to talk about the spiritual problem of stealing. How does stealing affect our soul? How does stealing affect our relationship with our heavenly father? You know, if any of you have had young kids or grandkids and were around them as they were learning to walk and talk, you know how precious and cute it can be, right? They begin to say things like mama and dada and baba. And it's great to watch them start to move around the house to begin to explore everything in the house. But it doesn't take long after they begin to talk that they learn another word. And the word is mine, mine, right? <laughs> they can have all the blocks on the floor and you try to take one of them away and what happens? Mine, right? Or they have their special blanket and it's time for it to go in the wash. It's been a little bit. And you try to take it away from them and what happens? Mine. And they grab it and they hold tight to it. And when kids are learning, it can be kind of cute. But really, are we all that different from them? Sometimes we claim things. We say, it's mine. And I brought another visual aid this morning to help us work this all out. I've got three boxes with me this morning. I've got a box that says, my stuff, one that says, God's stuff, and one that says, other stuff. And this stuff, the box that is my stuff, well, we love this, don't we? We want to hang on tight to it. We want to keep it close. We want to guard and protect it. But there comes a time when we start to look at all the stuff that's in my box and we're no longer satisfied. And so maybe we, we look at our neighbor's box and that's better stuff over there. And so maybe we're tempted to steal. Maybe we do steal. Maybe we borrow a tool from a neighbor and have no intention on really giving it back. Maybe we take a package off a porch. After all, who's going to know? Right? They'll file a claim. No big deal. And so we take things that don't belong to us. We can develop this attitude of, of what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. But today, the shift in our thinking that God would have us recognize is that all the stuff that's in my box, it actually belongs to God. It's actually God's. Everything that we have belongs to God. Everything that we own belongs to God and has been given to us by God. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, it says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. The truth is that our box is really empty. We do 
can bring anything into the world. We can take nothing out of it. Everything that we have belongs to God, and God gives generously to us. Everything that we have is loaned to us by God, and he gives it to us so that we can take care of ourselves and our families and those we care about. But the reality is, is it isn't my stuff. It belongs to God. He gives it to us. He calls us to be good stewards of the things we have. And this shift in thinking really begins to happen when we stop thinking about taking and hoarding and and the things that we've been given and see that we've been given to them, that they've been given to us by God. We realize that we're called to use what we have to be good stewards of it so that we can then share with others. We should allow God's spirit to transform how we view the things that he has given to us. Ephesians chapter four, verse 28, it says, Any of anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. See, you and I, we are called to work. We are called to gather. We are called to steward the gifts that God has given to us so that we can share with others. And there's no better example than our gospel reading for today, the story of Zacchaeus. And what I want you to recognize is how God transforms Zacchaeus' life for us to recognize the areas of our life where perhaps we've held too closely to our possessions, to our stuff, instead of learning to share with others. Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse one. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, a man named Zacchaeus, he was a, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Zacchaeus has a good job. He wasn't just a tax collector, but he was a chief tax collector. And tax collectors, well, they're not much different than tax collectors from today. They aren't very well liked. But in those days, tax collectors were despised because the, these were Israelites who were taxing their own people to support an oftentimes ruthless and repressive Roman government. Not only that, but tax collectors, they made their money by taking more than what they were supposed to. Zacchaeus, he isn't just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector. And so we can't know for sure, but chances are he had a whole group of other Israelites who worked for him, who went around and collected taxes from everybody, and he simply sat back and then collected the taxes for an occupying government, plus some more for himself. He was stealing from his own people. But our text makes one thing clear. Zacchaeus, he wants to see Jesus. He wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. He had heard about Jesus and all that he has done. And this man, Zacchaeus, this guy who was known for being a bad guy, he wants to see the Son of God. Our text goes on. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Zacchaeus may have been a bad guy, but we can learn from our text that he was resourceful. He knows that he's short. He knows that he's not gonna be able to see over all the people in the crowd, and so he goes and he climbs a tree just to get a glimpse, just to get a sight of Jesus. Point number one on your sermon insert for this morning, something that we can take away is that we can learn to be humble as Zacchaeus was. Now you may ask, well, how was Zacchaeus humble? Something that we need to realize about the ancient world. In the ancient world, men didn't run and they most certainly did not climb trees. Those were things that only children did. But Zacchaeus, he does both. He humbles himself by running ahead of the crowd and by climbing into a tree, doing something that only a child would do just to see Jesus. So let me ask, what are the areas in your life where you need to humble yourself? What are the things that we need to do even though they may make us uncomfortable or maybe put ourselves in a position where we may not look the best all for a chance to see Jesus. 
Where do we need to humble ourselves, make ourselves low? Or in the case of Zacchaeus, where do we need to run ahead and climb a tree just to see our Savior? Verses five and six, it goes on. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. You know, who knows what Zacchaeus was thinking. I can't imagine that he thought that Jesus would call his name. Point number two from your insert is be honest. We can learn to be honest from Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had no idea that Jesus would call his name and say that I need to stay with you. And chances are they were going to go and they were going to eat and drink and they were going to talk and have conversation. And from our story, we know that indeed they did talk. We know that Zacchaeus, he was honest about his shortcomings. He was honest about his failures. He was honest about all the times that he had taken what was not his. He was honest about his sin. As sinful people, sometimes we allow guilt and shame to kind of follow us around. Maybe we look back on our life and we remember things we have done. Or maybe we remember things we should have done and didn't. And we feel guilt and embarrassment and shame. And we can even begin to believe that those things, that they can disqualify us from the love of Jesus. Zacchaeus was known as the chief bad guy, yet nothing he had done kept him from the love of Jesus. Nothing he had done stopped Jesus from spending time with him. Nothing he had done stopped Jesus from embracing him. Nothing he had done stopped Jesus from coming to his house. Nothing he had done was enough to cause Jesus to stop loving him. When you and I, when we mess up, when we fail, when we fall short, when we struggle, when we're burdened by guilt and shame, when we're embarrassed by our sin, you and I, we are called to be honest. We're called to recognize who we are. We are sinners. But we're also called to recognize who God is. Our God is a God of great love. And so we turn to him we repent, we hand over all those things that bring us guilt and embarrassment and shame, we ask for his forgiveness, we're honest about our sin, and God promises to forgive us. The story goes on, and when they saw it, they all grumbled, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. You know, we only catch a, a small piece, a small glimpse of the conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus. Who knows what was said before or after? We don't know what was said around the table as they ate and drank, but we see, we can hear the difference, the transformation that took place in Zacchaeus when he met Jesus. Point number three is this, you and I, we are called to be generous. We're called to be generous with the things that God has given us. Even though Zacchaeus had made mistakes, he recognized that by meeting Jesus, his life was changed. He knew after meeting Jesus that he could be generous with the things that he had, with the things that God had given him. He could now be a blessing to others. You know, often, oftentimes when it comes to generosity, we are generous just enough, just to the point, as long as we are still comfortable. The gospel, it calls us to do something far greater. It calls us to give to the point that we are uncomfortable, to sacrificially give of ourselves, to give of our resources, of our time, of our talents, of our gifts, to give ourselves to others. Because Jesus sacrificially gave his life for you and for me. John chapter 10, verse 10, it reminds us, the thief has come to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This world that we live in, it's broken, it's sinful. The world we live in will take from us. But our God gives. 
You know, if you've ever been a part of a mission trip or a, a work project, if you've helped with rebuilding together or feed my starving children or any place where you've stepped outside yourself and you've served others, I think from those experiences, we all learn a few things. We learn just how blessed we really are. We learn that it can be a joy to bless and to serve others. You see, our stuff is not our stuff. The stuff that we have in life, it's on loan to us from God. We're called to give it away, to share with our neighbor. We have received the love of Almighty God. When he sent his son into this world, he said, this is how much I love you. This is how much I'm willing to give for you. Our God doesn't take, he gives. And he then calls us to give to others, to share with those around us. We give of our time, our talents, our skills, our gifts. We share with others. And sometimes in life it feels like our box is, is empty, like we have nothing else that we can give and share with anyone else. But let me tell you, our God never runs out. Even though we may run dry, our God gives to us again. He fills us up, he gives us joy, he shows us the love of Christ, and it fills us up again. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, it says, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in, your, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. He's talking about being generous. We are called to be people of grace. We are called to be generous with all that God has given us. We are called to recognize that all that we have ultimately belongs to God. And God calls us to then use the things that we have to share his love and his grace with others so that they may know and see his love in us. And through the Holy Spirit working in them, then be connected to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you please stand? Now may the grace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever focused on the cross and empty tomb of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Hear now the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's remain standing as we join together in our closing song, Blessed Be Your Name. As everything comes from our Heavenly Father, uh, whether we are in plenty or in need, we trust in his name and we bless his name. So join us in singing, Blessed Be Your Name. Sweet.
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. For leading us in worship this morning. Uh, you may be seated. A couple of quick announcements for you before we go this morning. First, uh, there is a congregation meeting coming up uh, Tuesday, June 21st at 6.30 here in the worship center. A couple of important things are gonna happen at that meeting. We need to approve our budget for this next fiscal year, uh, so July to June of 22 through 23. And then also, there is a recommendation to call a uh, children and Family Ministry Director. Uh, we are looking to extend a call to Cassidy Halesso, and you can find a write-up on her uh, on that second page of your weekly news. Encourage you to take that home, read through that, uh, and hope to see you there for that important meeting. Uh, let's see, number two. Lutheran High Annual Golf Outing is happening this coming Friday out at Quickweak. If you'd like to support Lutheran High, uh, Find out more information, encourage you. Go to their website, lutheranhigh.com uh, backslash golf outing. Find more information there and register online if you'd like to support that. Uh, let's see, Ductona is coming up July 3rd. Family activities, 7 a.m. all the way to 5 p.m. And notice that last line. You have the chance to dunk our very own Pastor Rob. Uh, it's there in the center page of your weekly news. 1 to 1.30, he will be in the dunk tank. I'm not encouraging you. I'm informing you. That's all it is. <laughs> That's all it is, just information. Uh, they'll also have that pancake breakfast that they always do at Ductona. All of the money from the pancake breakfast, from anything that's thrown at Pastor Rob, all of that goes to support Feed My Starving Children, uh, which is a wonderful ministry uh, that'll be coming up here in October. And if you have another way to support it, uh, another way to support it is through the money tubes. Those are found back at our Welcome Center. Uh, you can pick those up, fill it with quarters, drop it in the mailbox over by the office, outside on one of the pillars. Uh, there's a mailbox there. You can just put that in there. And all of that goes to support that wonderful ministry that will be happening here again in October. Thank you once again for joining us. God's blessings to you. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and a wonderful week in the Lord. God bless everyone.